Welcome to How to Talk to Anyone About Energy. I'm Alex Epstein, author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels and the president of the Center for Industrial Progress. And I have been thinking about teaching a course like this uh, for, for years probably, but particularly in the last couple months. I've gotten one question over and over and over and over, and I haven't had a really good answer to it, and I finally do now. And so that question is, if, I'm, if I agree with you, Alex, if I'm an advocate of what I'd call energy abundance, including the moral case for fossil fuels, what can I do when I talk to friends, neighbors, family about these issues? And this is particularly relevant now. I'm recording this the day before Thanksgiving. I'm perhaps cutting it a little bit close because I'm going from Laguna Beach to uh, LAX, which is the Los Angeles airport, to fly to the Washington DC area, uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland in particular, where I'm visiting my family. And for many people, particularly people within the energy industry and within that, particularly within the fossil fuel industry, can have a lot of dread around that. Now, maybe if they're around their comfort zone, the people and their family that might be in the industry, it's no big deal. But what about when you run into that person who went to Harvard or who's from the East Coast or who's from the West Coast and they say, how can you do what you're doing for a living? Or how can you justify fracking? It's contaminating our groundwater. It's causing earthquakes. It's causing climate change. What is going on? And, and this can be overwhelming. I think it can be difficult even if you are a professional communicator. I know a lot of professional communications people ask me uh, for help in doing something like this, but let alone if, if your job is to do is nothing related to communications. You're not practicing this. What do you do? And so the usual thing that comes up is somebody will say, well, can you give me a talking point or a line to use when somebody says X? So if they ask this question about fracking, then you have a response and then I'll give you a response to something else. And there's, there is something true to that. But I think there's a much, much more powerful answer, and that's going to be the subject of this course. So the goal of this course is in 90 minutes, and we're going to break it up into six different topics or modules, we're going to turn supporters of energy abundance, that's you, if you don't consider yourself basically in line with the energy abundance moral case for fossil fuels line of thinking, that's totally okay, but first go read the moral case for fossil fuels, because this is assuming you're already in basic agreement, then how do you persuade the many people uh, who disagree with you? So it's the goal is to make you literally, literally twice as effective. So you go home for Thanksgiving, you have some antagonistic people, you learn how to frame things the way we're gonna talk about, you feel much better and you're much more effective and you can do more in less time, which is the goal in anything, particularly here. And then on a longer time scale, we wanna give you the tools to make yourself 10 times more effective. And I mean that literally 10 times more effective. Now, part of that is that I think the tools we're gonna to discuss today are incredibly effective. The other thing is I think that common practice in one-on-one -on -one discussion is incredibly ineffective and that's not to be hard on anyone, that's actually good news. Because the more we learn that we're not doing the right thing now, the more upside there is in terms of room for improvement. If you were already doing the best possible and not getting the results you wanted, that would be tragic. But if you're making some huge mistake that is correctable without an enormous amount of effort, an enormous amount of time as well, that is good news. And so I have good news for you today. So to get there, we're going to have six 15 minute modules. Now my basic commitment is 90 minutes overall. They're not each going to be 15 minutes. They're, they're going to be weighted uh, pro probably pretty differently. And in particular, number two is going to be huge. I'm going to argue that number two, this idea of the rules of constructive discussion is a complete game changer. I think that my over the years discovery of, of what rules to follow and what rules to hold everybody to so that a, uh, a discussion is constructive 
just changes the whole game and makes it better for everybody. It's not a trick. It's actually something to make sure that everything is honest and that way the truth has a better chance of winning out. And that way people can really get clarity instead of just arguing across each other about 15 different issues. But step one is going to be, before we understand the solution about how to do this, it's important to understand the problem. Why is it that discussing energy and environmental issues is so hard, even though I'm gonna argue fundamentally it isn't. I'm gonna argue fundamentally, you can make a lot of progress with just about anyone. So we've got why it's hard, then we've got the rules, then, couple of ideas I'll just intrigue you with here and then elaborate later. Don't try to convince, share how you uh, came to be convinced. And then the next one, number four, is gonna be the easiest, most powerful, and most underutilized way to change someone's thinking. Then we're gonna go into in-depth discussion, do's and don'ts. And then we're going to go into upgrading your own understanding and, and clarity. So that's, that's the agenda. Each one of these will be clear as we go along. So let's start out with why discussing energy and environmental issues seems so hard, even though it isn't. So again, this is what happens all the time. This is the question I get, and, and these are the kinds of objections you get. So in this course, we're going to take this general line of question about fracking as our, as our object lesson. I'm going to take you step by step with how I address this kind of issue. And I, I really want to uh, thank actually uh, a group of, of uh, very bright young people at the company Pioneer Energy. Uh, Pioneer Energy is a company with about 4,000 people. The CEO, Scott Sheffield, I, I met him at an event and I tried to convince him, you know, if you, you really want to get your employees to be champions, get them the moral case for fossil fuels. That is the most organized way I know of learning these things. And if you have that level of clarity that's in that book, if you have access to that, it, it'll change their, their lives. And he, he took me up on that. He got a copy for each person in the company. And in exchange, I agreed to come uh, speak at the, uh, the company for free, which I don't usually do. So anyone listening to this, you don't get that offer. But they were the first to do it. And I wanted to see what happened. And when I got there, uh, the employees only had the book for a couple days, actually, although some of them had read it in advance, and they were already super excited and, and had lots of questions, but the number one question was this, this, what do I do when I talk to friends, neighbors, family? And I thought, you know what, we need a supplement. We need the clarity, which I'm going to argue is the fundamental, but we also need the methodology of how you communicate your clarity to other people, including in these kinds of sticky situations. And to develop this course, I said, all right, well, you guys tell me what the trickiest situations you run into are. And then I'm just going to, off the top of my head, respond how I would respond in real life, because I've been in thousands of things like this and, and learned a lot over the years. And then we'll see what are the principles. So the example we're taking today is actually, in many cases, almost verbatim from a discussion I had in, in one of our, our uh our mock discussions, but it very much resembles, I think you'll see, the way things go in real life. So I think that'll help to uh, what we can call concretize the principles to make them more real, to show you for each of these principles how it applies to a discussion about fracking. And then you can imagine it can apply to coal or climate or you know any of the other uh, dimensions of things. So that's the number one question. Now the fact is that in most cases, the answer is not very uh, effective. So with this kind of fracking discussion, if you've been in one or, or, or fill in the blank with your own, the discussion will just go all over the place. You know, they'll say something, you'll respond, they'll interrupt, it gets emotional, you know, you get accused of things, you get mad sometimes, you don't know what to say, they bombard you with a million things, how are you gonna ever do that? And before you know it, an hour or two has passed, nothing has been accomplished, perhaps friendships or family relationships have been degraded, but you definitely don't feel the feeling of empowerment that you feel when another human being has more knowledge and more clarity in his or her head because of what you said or did. And that is possible. Uh, I get that experience all the time, but it's because I know the method that I'm going to share with you. So to measure how much progress you make, I want to start out by having you measure where you are. 
So I'm going to talk about your energy persuasion aptitude. Now, some of you might have noticed that 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 the letters for that are EPA, which is just kind of funny. Uh, but this is a different EPA. This is a better EPA. So this is your energy persuasion aptitude. So on a scale of negative five to five, what is your energy persuasion aptitude? How good are you? I like to think of it as neutralizing attackers. How good are you at turning non-supporters into supporters? How good are you at turning supporters into champions? And I, I use the scale of negative five to five because I, I don't like one to 10 for communications because that implies that any effort you put in will somehow be positive, and that is not true. We can see, you know, anyone who's ever been in any kind of relationship has seen, well, sometimes when I say something, that makes things worse. Hopefully not most of the time, but it definitely can happen. So sometimes you actually make things worse by having the conversation. So where do you, where do you stand? Might be zero, you don't feel like you're making much progress, might be negative one, might be one. I think a lot of people feel like they're in that, that range. And it's understandable that you're in that range because there are a lot of things that can go wrong that if you're not aware of them and you don't really understand them, it's just really hard to make progress, particularly in a culture that has antagonistic views. So I like this expression, respect the problem. If we're going to try to do something new and groundbreaking, we need to first respect the problem, understand why the problem is so hard in the first place. So here's what I see as the, the problem. It's helpful to think of all persuasion as figuring out a way to take someone from their context, both of facts and emotions, so I like to call that point A, and then you're taking them from that toward your factual emotional context, which is point B. And the thing to get is that that distance is enormous. We can call it a chasm even. There's so many, if you believe in something like the moral case for fossil fuels, that contradicts so much of what we hear, whether we're in grade school or in grad school or in career. I, I like to think of it as the average person has at least 200 hours of what I view as miseducation on energy issues, and very few even get one hour of true education. So if, if you feel like you've got the truth, you've got this seemingly insurmountable amount of miseducation to overcome. So just let's take the example of, of fracking. So even just with fracking itself, there's the concerns about groundwater, earthquakes, chemicals causing cancer, noise caused by the operations, road damage, uh, housing prices going up so the locals can't afford houses anymore, uh, methane leakage, you name it. But then on top of that, that's not just it, because in a fracking discussion, the issue of climate will probably come up. And so then you have all the issues connected uh, to climate. So the dying polar bears and the melting ice caps, and isn't this the hottest year on record, and aren't we having rising sea levels, and the storms are becoming more dangerous, and look at California, how can you deny that there's a catastrophe, and how can you be engaged in fracking instead of moving to clean green renewables, right? It's just so much, and, and it seems like even one of those would be hard, and you got all of them, and then every day, it's not as if the media are chipping away at this and trying to educate properly. They themselves are immersed in this, so they're reinforcing it every day. So that's what I call respecting the problem. There, there is this difficulty. So what do we do? And this, I think, is really the key. We have to realize that the key issue is not a particular fact or a particularly or a particular emotion uh, somebody has in regard to this issue. It's the method. And if you've read the moral case for fossil fuels, you know that a lot of the case has to do with establishing the right method for figuring out what's right and wrong, and then applying it to fossil fuels. So if we think of this point A and point B thing, 
the vast majority of the, the distance is actually in the method of thinking. And, and this is true in general. Usually if, if you find yourself at odds over lots and lots and lots and lots of specifics, it's usually not a purely factual dispute if you come down to it. There are issues of, of values and, the, and issues of values are partially an issue of, of method. One issue of method is what are we, what do we take as valuable? How do we measure value? What is our, our standard of value or, or our moral standard? So in moral case for fossil fuels, I name three methods. They're not, they're not the only methods, but there are three methods that are really important, that are essential to come to the right conclusion about energy and environmental issues and really any other controversy. So there's the issue of the big picture, which means we have to look at, at everything. We have to look at the positives and negatives very carefully of all the alternatives. We can't just use, we can't just look at the positives of one and the negatives of another, and we can't just act like the negatives of one are huge if they might be mild. So, and when we use terminology, therefore, we have to be clear about magnitude. We can't just say climate change. We have to be clear, do we mean catastrophic man-made climate change? Or do we mean a moderate climate change, moderate warming, mild even, or none? You have to be really clear about magnitudes of things. So uh, another issue you have to be clear about is what is your goal? And this, this I think is the most subtle but most important. What is your, your moral standard? Are we measuring good and bad by the ideal of being green, which means minimizing our impact, which means that any impact we have on climate is immoral, even if it was good for humans, it would be immoral. And even if it's you know mild and not that consequential, it should be a huge moral focus because it's wrong to change things, period. Or, or is our moral standard, we want to maximize human well-being, so we judge impacts on climate in the full context of, is the action that's impacting climate overall good for human life or overall bad for human life? And then the third thing is, is an issue of experts. How do we use experts? Experts are cited all the time. You hear this 97% of climate scientists agree. And it's important to realize that the way that we treat experts, and in particular, whether we treat them as authorities to be obeyed without explanation, or, or uh, to the contrary, in contrast, do we view them as as advisors who are obligated to explain their positions, including how much they know and how they know it. So the proper view is experts as advisors. So you can't just say 97% of scientists agree with this vague thing and then that's okay. No, you, you're welcome to cite that, but you have to explain what exactly they mean and why. Why are they saying it? What is their proof? Everybody has to prove their case. So the idea, and, and this is really discussed at length in the moral case for fossil fuels and, and really culminated in a long explanation in chapter 9, which is the last chapter. The reason for all of this huge volume of attacks against fossil fuels in particular, but also nuclear power uh, is, is a close second, is because the method of thinking is not focused on the big picture, is not focused on human life, and is focused on obedience to so-called experts not actually having the experts be clear thinkers who provide proof for their claims. So the good news about this is if we can convince people of the right method, then what happens is very quickly the way they think about everything else changes. So if they hear something about polar bears, first of all, they know a lot of these quote unquote experts have a horrific track record of being wrong. And then they also think, well, how am I prioritizing polar bears? Is it if I'm looking at the big picture and recognize that the fossil fuel industry is the only industry capable of providing cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for billions, if if that goal actually required the death of X number of polar bears or the change of their habitat, would that be worth it? Well, if I'm on a human standard of value, absolutely it would. So you see how how the same issue can be filtered and processed completely different based on the method. And the nice thing about the methods, the proper methods, is that even though people don't practice them, it's almost impossible to argue with any of the right methods. So that means that it's actually easy and people will be grateful for you to name fairly early in the conversation the method 
that you should use to resolve the issue before jumping in to your view. The, the, the mistake that is always made is to just jump into, oh, this is what I think about fracking. Here's my answer without stepping back and saying, okay, great. Well, for sure, let's talk about this, but how are we going to come at the right answer? How are we going to know if fracking is good or not? Well, here's how we're going to know. And this gets to the rules of constructive discussion and how to enforce them. And this is probably going to be uh, the longest part of the course because once you get this, everything else is relatively easy. And if you don't get this, everything will always be hard.